Well, friends, our, our uh, theme in VBS this week was bold like Jesus, and, and we talked with the children about all sorts of aspects of what that means to, to be bold in our faith. And, you know, boldness, I think, can look like a lot of different things, and when you hear that word, or if you, uh, if you picture someone who you perceive to be bold, uh, you probably have certain attributes you associate with that, right? Somebody who's bold maybe is somebody who has, we might think, has a lot of confidence, um, or maybe there's somebody who, who just... Uh, does a lot more speaking than they do listening, or, uh, you, you know, it, it comes from different places, right? And, and sometimes that boldness maybe is a false boldness. Maybe that boldness is really a, a way to compensate for some self-doubt or some fear or something, and it, it's sort of a braggadocious sort of trying to, trying to pretend kind of, kind of boldness. Um, there's different types of boldness, and it comes from different places. I think the best kind of boldness comes from confidence, but what I want to ask us today to think about is where is that confidence placed? Is that confidence in ourselves? Is it in God? Where does that confidence come from? And I was thinking a little bit about this this week as here and there I've been trying to catch as much of the Olympics as I could along the way. Anybody in here been watching the Olympics? Yeah, having a great time? I love the Olympics. I, I would sit and watch it all day if I could. I love the Olympics. And for me, I'm, I'm just inspired by these people who you know have just put everything they've got into this endeavor, and they're putting it all out there. But as I was thinking about, about boldness, I was comparing some of, the, some of what I saw. And, you know, one of, somebody that I relate to that I thought was really impressive was Noah Lyles, right? He, he, won, he was a 100-meter champion. Uh, he is an American. And, of course, when, when Noah got introduced, what, what would he do? Did anybody remember what he would do when he'd get introduced? He'd come out on the track. He was like, he was just like, whoa, he, full speed, like jumping up and down, screaming, yelling, and I thought, yeah, that, I, that's kind of how I would do it too. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, the athlete who impressed me a lot more with their boldness uh, was the U.S. 400-meter hurdler champion, Sydney McLaughlin Lavroni. Did anybody watch her? So she, she reset again her own world record in the 400 hurdles. And she runs the 400 hurdles way faster than most of us could ever think about just running the 400 straight, right? It's unbelievable. But, um, but Cindy McLaughlin Lavroni, who is, who is unparalleled, like nobody can touch her, uh, she is so humble. And her boldness comes from a different kind of place. It's really kind of cool to see. And you, you see her win the Olympics, set the world record, and, and she is not jumping up and down, hooting and hollering, waving a finger around. She's just quietly within herself like, yeah, that was good. That was good. Um, and, and so I wanted to share she had posted on Instagram this week after that that I in a lot of ways. And so um, Sydney said this. She said, what an honor, a blessing, and a privilege. I never want to take these moments for granted. In a week where my faith was tried, my peace wavered, and the weight of the world began to descend, God was beyond gracious. It's always hard preparing for one moment you may or may not get back. And in my mind, what kept repeating were the words, trust in Jesus, trust in Jesus. I didn't know what the outcome would be, but I did know he was who I wanted to lead me through the journey. What an amazing journey it was. It never ceases to amaze me how powerful he is to help those who trust in him to overcome the battles within. His word is sufficient. His promises hold true. And all the glory belongs to him. At the end of the day, it is far beyond gold. And then she quoted from Psalm 115. She said, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. For the sake of your steadfast love, and your faithfulness. This is the fastest woman in the world at 400 hurdles. Uh, and she was on the gold medal winning 400 relay as well. And if you saw that split, how? Um, but you, you sense that humbleness and that gratitude and that sense of like, no, this is all God, it's not me. And, you know, we've been spe uh, talking these last number of weeks about Daniel. And we've talked about how as a young man, Daniel was taken away into exile into Babylon. And then this struggle that he faced on a daily basis of how to stay true to his faith in a culture uh, that was completely, uh, completely foreign to him. 
And we, we've talked about the ways that he had to hold on to that faith and trust in God to get him through day after day. And, and this battle he faced to remain faithful to his God. And, and so as we come along in the story today, um, we're, t- we're talking about this idea of peaceful boldness. Because that's what I see in Daniel is a peaceful boldness. And it's what I also see in Sidney uh, McLaughlin Lozoni is this peaceful boldness. And, and so I want, I want to ask you for a moment just to consider your own sense, first of all, your own sense of peacefulness and your own sense of boldness. And where do those things come from? What is that, how does that manifest in your life? Because I think sometimes a boldness for us might come from a place of self-righteousness. We might become bold because we think we know the answers or we think that we, 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 we've got it, we know it better than somebody else. And, and in fact, sometimes, unfortunately, we'll see Christians that are, have a self-righteous kind of boldness about how they've got it all together or got it figured out, right? Um, and sometimes we see a boldness that's rooted in one's own confidence. Uh, you know, I, I think Noah Lyles probably is an example of that, of he knows how darn good he is and he's going to show everybody, right? And, um, uh, and then you have Sidney McLaughlin who, who's like, yeah, yeah, I'm leaning into Jesus this week and I'm going to trust him with the journey. Wow, wow. So when we pick up the story of Daniel today, actually uh, a big shift has happened. Um, if you remember, uh, he was a young man, as I said, and he's going to be in exile for a long, long time. And actually what's happened now, it's been 66 years since the Babylonians uh, uh, conquered Jerusalem. And actually they've, the Babylonians have just been defeated by the Persians and the Medes. Now, like per, the Persians are the modern-day Iranians, okay? It's from that area of the world. And the, the Persians and the Medes have taken over. They've defeated the Babylonians. But here's what's interesting. Daniel, who, you know, has served so faithfully all these years in the Babylonian court, he's been in charge of a large swath of the Babylonian empire. When the Medes take over, King Darius, the Mede, sees immediately the value of this man, Daniel. And so from the very beginning, Daniel is continues to be in a key leadership position in now the Mede Empire because he is obviously somebody who is very wise, uh, very trustworthy. He leads, he works with excellence. And so he has, he's been kept in this position of, of, of leadership. Now, did you know what I said 66 years later, which means he's in his 80s, okay? Daniel in this story today is in his 80s. He's an older man. He's lived a long life, and he's been fighting this battle of staying true to his faith for decades, right? Decades. He has practiced at this. And this is why I say Daniel has a peaceful boldness about him. Because as we read this story about the lion's den, there is not a hint of anxiety, of worry, of concern. And note, you'll, you'll notice what Daniel does when, um, when he's faced with this situation, how he responds, And so again, I want to challenge you to think about your own sense of boldness, your own sense of peace. Let's put those two words together, a peaceful boldness, and think about what that might look like. So let's dive into this story. Most of us have heard this from the time we were were tiny, but let's let's get some of the details here. So Daniel chapter 6, we read, So the administrators and high officers went to the king and said, Long live King Darius. We are all in agreement, we administrators, officials, high officers, advisors, and governors, that the king should make a law that will be strictly enforced. Give orders that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions. And now, your majesty, issue and sign this law so it cannot be changed, an official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. So King Darius signed the law. Okay, pause there. What's happening here is similar to what was happening before in the Babylonian Empire, right? So we got the, we got the new, new guys in town setting up the new thing. And once again, people are jealous of Daniel. What's inspiring to me is, is Daniel clearly was a man that was above reproach. There, there was like, there was no, there were no chinks in his armor. Like they had no way to take him down. And they're like, this dude just, like, what's the, what's the deal with this guy? And so, once again, uh, this group of people who are jealous about his position and power uh, want to take him down. 
and they come up with this scheme. If we can get the king to make up this rule, we know that we can catch Daniel and get rid of him. Now, the Persians and the Medes, their approach to, to the laws that the king signed was this. Once a king signed a law, that law could not be changed or revoked. Like, it, it was now, it was it. There was no going back. That was it. And so if they could get this law signed, they could catch Daniel, and there would be a problem. So, so this law is signed. This is the deal. If you are caught praying to anyone besides King Darius, for the next 30 days, you would be thrown into the lion's den. Right now, the, the Medes and the Persians, um, they, they seem to have, they collected lions almost like, maybe like a, like a zoo kind of situation where, hey, these are cool to look at. But also, the lions were clearly a way to show power and to put a little fear in the population. You see the lions over there? Mm-hmm. Right? And so um, maybe even a little bit of entertainment in that. And so the, this threat was real. Uh, if anybody doesn't tow the line, we'll just send you over to visit the lions for a bit and see how that goes for you. So that's the situation. That's the threat. Now notice what Daniel does in response to this. Verse 10. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open towards Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. Then the officials went together to Daniel's house and they found him praying and asking for God's help. So they went straight to the king and reminded him about his law. Did you not sign a law that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone divine or human except you, your majesty, will be thrown into the lion's den? Yes, the king replied. That decision stands. It's an official law of the Medes and the Persians that cannot be revoked. Then they told the king, that man, Daniel, One of the captives from Judah is ignoring you and your law. He still prays to his God three times a day. So what was Daniel's response to this new law? He just kept doing his usual thing, right? It said he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open towards Jerusalem. In other words, Daniel's going to keep doing his thing. Okay, this man in his 80s had a routine. Three times a day, he stopped everything that he was doing, and he spent time in prayer. This is how Daniel stayed grounded. This is how Daniel stayed rooted in his faith. This is how Daniel stayed clear about who he was and who he was as one of God's people. Every day, three times a day, he stopped what he was doing to spend time in prayer. Now, when you do that day after day, year after year, what happens to you? You get formed. You get shaped. You get changed. You know, so often when we think about uh, spiritual disciplines, we want to start a new practice of praying more often or reading the Bible. We try it for a few days, maybe if we're lucky, a few weeks, and pretty soon we're like, this isn't worth, I'm really, I don't really feel like anything's happening or I'm not getting anywhere or, you know, and Don't we as modern people, like, we expect things to happen right now, right? And we want to see that thing change in us immediately, and and we we want to see the results. Daniel has been sticking with this day after day, year after year, now in his 80s. Daniel is well shaped and formed. And so when the king issues this decree... It doesn't even cross, I I doubt, it doesn't say, but I doubt it even crosses his mind that he should do anything different, right? Because, Because, of course, Daniel, he's not afraid of dying. He's not afraid of dying. He's lived a long life. He's, he's, seen, he's seen it all, right? I mean, he's lived through his own people being conquered and then the people that conquered him being conquered again, right? He's, 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 seen, he's seen bad stuff. But he knows that God can be trusted, He knows that God's got him in this life and in the next. And so if if he dies, he dies. Like, okay, that's going to happen sometimes. So if he dies, he dies. Daniel's not worried about it. He sticks with what he knows to be true, and he continues to worship and pray to God every day like he always. Now, I don't know about you, but I might think, but you probably could close your windows this time or like, you know, like, I mean, you could. 
pray without the windows being wide open where everybody can see, you know, and, and it's not that Daniel's, you know, doing this in a showy way, right? For him, he faces Jerusalem because that's his homeland. It reminds him where he's from and who he is. That's a way of grounding him in his faith. Um, and so just as he always does, he, he kneels down to pray with his windows open. And clearly his prayer was not a quick 30 second, oh, I'm glad I got that done. I'm out of here. Like obviously his prayer time, there, there was some time to it. And so these officials show up, they come to check on him, they can't wait to catch him. Obviously, this is a routine that he sticks to because they knew where to find him and when to find him there. And they show up and he doesn't try to pretend that's not what he's doing, right? It's just, yep, I'm praying, that's what I do. So they go to the king, they tell the king, and now the question is, what happens next? Well, most of us know where this story's going, um, but let's follow along. And one thing I want to note here is you'll see in this response from King Darius that it's clear that King Darius really respected Daniel, that Daniel um, served with such excellence that he, he clearly was a man that King Darius wanted to keep around. He clearly was a man that, that uh, King Darius saw value in. So you'll see that in the response, but let's go ahead and see what happens. So <clears throat> hearing this, the king was deeply troubled. And he tried to think of a way to save Daniel. He spent the rest of the day looking for a way to get Daniel out of this predicament. And in the evening, the men went together to the king and said, Your majesty, you know that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no law that the king signs can be changed. So at last, the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of lions. The king said to him, May your God, whom you serve so faithfully, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed the stone with his own royal seal and the seals of his nobles, so that no one could rescue Daniel. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night fasting. He refused his usual entertainment and couldn't sleep at all that night. All right, so Daniel's been thrown into the lion's den. We all know that's not a good thing. King Darius clearly is um, up, up in arms about this, but he signed the law, so what can he do? And um, he goes home, has a sleepless night, wondering what's going to happen. So let's see what happens in the morning when he goes back to check on the situation. Very early the next morning, the king got up and hurried out to the lion's den. When he got there, he called out in anguish, Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God whom you serve so faithfully able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, long live the king. My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me. For I've been found innocent in his sight and I've not wronged you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be lifted from the den. Not a scratch was found on him for he had trusted in his God. So King Darius rushes to the lion's den. Miraculously, Daniel doesn't even have a scratch on him. And Daniel proclaims, he says, my God sent an angel to shut the lion's mouth. So we have this supernatural event that happens. Daniel is protected. He's just fine. He is taken back out of the lion's den. He survived the night. Um, Now we're going to wrap up the story i got to warn you, the, this next verse is a bit gruesome, um, but let's continue to think about our own sense of peaceful boldness, and we'll, we'll tie things up here. So verse 24, then the king gave orders to arrest the men who had maliciously accused Daniel. He had them thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. The lions leaped on them and tore them apart before they even hit the floor of the den. So apparently they were hungry. That wasn't the issue. Okay. Then King Darius sent this message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world. Peace and prosperity to you. I decree that everyone throughout my kingdom should tremble with fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and he will endure forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed and his rule will never end. He rescues and saves his people. He performs miraculous signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So we see here that in this story, once again, in Daniel's peaceful boldness, God is glorified. God gets the glory. Now, just to give you a a quick little peek ahead, 
Um, as I said, this is 66 years after the exile um, began. Uh, in just a few years, at about, it was, had been prophesied they would be in exile for 70 years. In fact, in just a few years, the Persians uh, and the Medes, they will sign a decree that says, hey, all of you uh, Jewish folks who were taken into exile by the Babylonians, you can go home now. And um, some of these Jewish folks will go back to Jerusalem and start rebuilding the temple. And that will be the next part of the story of the people of Israel and, and what happens. But right now, that has not happened yet. They are still in exile, but now under the thumb of the Persians and the Medes. And uh, Daniel has lived through this in incredibly, uh, I would think, traumatic experience. So let's think about uh, ourselves and the circumstances we face each and every day and how we respond and react to those things. And let's consider where, where our sense of, um, of confidence, our sense of peace, where those things come from. And how often don't we, my friends, we, we feel ourselves, we're, we're fighting with anxiety, right? Um, we, we fight with a, with, a, with a lot of self-doubt, a lot of uncertainty about what's happening next and is everything going to be okay and how, how are we going to do this and so on and so forth. And, you know, we, we have an, an impending election and we're, you know, we're pretty sure that if the person on the other side wins, the world will come to an end and it's going to be terrible, just spoiler, that's not going to be the case, right? But, but we carry all this around, and, and, and then we look at Daniel. And for me, I think of Jesus, right? Peaceful boldness. All, all this stuff that the world tells us to worry about all the time, what are we doing? What are we worrying about? And that's not that we don't have to be responsible people. It's not that we, we don't need to, uh, we, it's not that we shouldn't be good stewards of all that God entrusts to us. But the point is, where is our trust? Where do we place our confidence? Daniel's confidence was fully in God. He knew that God had him. Whether he lived or died, God had him. And it, it didn't, literally didn't matter. And how often are we able to come into each new day with that sense of peaceful confidence, that it doesn't matter, you know, in that sense? So we're going to have this new series this fall on becoming like Jesus. And I want to invite you, if you find this idea of peaceful boldness to be something that is elusive for you, but it's something you desire, I think this book series is going to be helpful. How, how can we be a people who live with that sense of groundedness, that sense of clarity, sense of confidence that's not in ourselves, but it's in who God is? who we are as God's people. You know, so I go back again to, um, to Sidney McLaughlin Ravoni this morning. Uh, if you have a chance, um, you know, go to her post-race interview if you can find that and just listen to how she talks about what, what she's, what's been happening or um, you can see some of her posts on social media. An individual who's accomplished incredible things who from human standards has every right to say, yeah, look at me, I'm the best. Look what I've done. And all you hear from her is, I just want to thank Jesus. That's what you hear. And you hear this sense of gratitude for what God's done in her life. And a sense of peace about the battle. And I, and I, I think we could get a sense of, you know, she talked about this week leading up to the race. And, you know, I, I don't know about you, but as I watch those, uh, whether it's a race or a game, um, how many of you watched the basketball game yesterday? Anybody watch the fourth quarter? There's a lot of screaming in my house. <clears throat> Mostly by me, but... <clears throat> it was exuberant screaming, actually. Anyway, um, you know, you can, you can understand the pressure for, the, for some of these individuals, right? The Olympics is every four years, so you spend four years focused on one day. Four years focused on one day. And you can imagine the, the mental games that are going on uh, as you think about, but what if, what if, what if I mess up? What, what if something happens? What if I clip the hurdle? What if I stumble? Um, what if I, what if I lose? What if I look silly on a world stage and everybody's been talking about me and what if I don't measure up? You know, and all of us are like, hey, I'd be happy to make it around the track one time, <laughs> right? 
So, so we, all, you know, we all face our own individual kinds of pressures, don't we? And we make up these things about how we have to perform and what we need to do and how big and important a single day is. And you hear Sydney just saying, you know, as I came through this week, one phrase just kept coming back to me. Trust in Jesus. Trust in Jesus. Trust in Jesus. So you see, Sydney has also shaped her mind to focus in a certain place. She's been formed to say to herself, trust in Jesus, when she feels that anxiety, when she feels that pressure. And so where do we go when we get up every morning and we're looking at all the stuff in front of us and what's going through our mind? Is it, I trust in you, Lord? Or is it all sorts of other kinds of things, right? So back to Daniel. Daniel was formed by decades of discipline of on purpose, praying to God three times a day. That was his approach. Maybe that approach would work for you. Maybe it needs to be something else. Well, what kind of intentional discipline can you build into your routine that will shape you, will form you to be more and more like Jesus, that will shape you and form you to help you to plant your feet in a place that gives you a sure confidence to meet everything that comes your way? What can you build into your daily life that will help your mind to instantly go trust in Jesus rather than all the other places that we go? What we find from Daniel and what we hear over and over again in the book of Daniel is that the God of Israel, Yahweh, the God of Jesus, our God, can be trusted. That even in the hard stuff, even when it looks like the world is against us, God is there. God will always be there. We can trust in him. Friends, when we know that in our bones, we can live with a peaceful boldness. So let's, let's do that. Let's do that. Let's pray. Almighty God, Lord, you know... Um, the ways we struggle to be anchored in you. And you know the, the struggles we, we face each and every day. There's so much pressure. There's um, a lot of anxiety. There's so many things, Lord, that we're weighing all the time. And God, to be honest, we get lost in it. And sometimes it's overwhelming. And the truth is, God, often we doubt you. We don't trust you. We don't trust that you've got us. We don't trust that we'll be okay. And so, God, we ask you to help us. Help us to really know in our bones that we're going to be okay. That in life and in death, you've got us. That we can trust in you. God, help us to choose a way of life that forms us in your way. Help us to choose, Lord, to daily, daily to turn to you, to look to you, to call out to you, to invite you into into our hearts, into our minds, into our activities. God, we thank you for Daniel's example of peaceful boldness. May we be a people who are bold, not with self-righteousness, not with self-confidence, not not a faulty boldness, Lord, that that is out of fear. But let us be bold peacefully with our confidence in you. We thank you, Jesus, for choosing us. We thank you for dying for us. We ask you to empower us each day to be peacefully bold for you. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen.